Welcome to the Legally Speaking Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Hanna. This week, I'm delighted to be joined by Becky Anderson. Becky is the Director of Engagement at the Chancery Lane Project. Becky got her MBA in legal practice and trained as a solicitor at the firm Bird and Bird. She then spent 14 years working as a commercial contract solicitor and then as a senior editor at the Practical Law before moving to her current role. So a very, very warm welcome, Becky. Thank you so much for having me on, Rob. It's really great to be here. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on the Legally Speaking podcast. Before we dive into all your amazing achievements and projects to date, we do have a customary icebreaker question here on the Legally Speaking podcast. On the scale of 1 to 10, 10 being very real, what would you rate the hit TV series Suits in terms of its reality? Do you know, I'm going to be really real with you. I've never seen Suits. (gasps) That is absolutely fine because quite a few of our guests haven't seen Suits. So uh, based on that... I'm going to say 10. 10. There we go. Yeah, most people go zero and give the legal response saying, well, I haven't seen it, so there's no way I could give comments, so it has to be zero. But I like the optimism and 10. So we'll stick with that and we'll move (laughs) swiftly on. So to begin with, Becky, would you mind telling us a bit about your background and journey? Yeah, sure. So um, I knew from quite a young age, actually, that I wanted to be a solicitor, which sounds quite dull. I should have probably thought to myself, I want to be a rock star. But no, there was there was 12 year old Becky thinking, I want to be a solicitor. That sounds brilliant. Um, and so then that's what I worked towards. Um, I trained, as you know, um, at Bird and Bird, because at the time I thought I wanted to be an intellectual property lawyer. But it turned out through spending time um, doing your uh, doing my different seats that what really got me going was commercial law. Um, and I very quickly moved from um, private practice into in-house. Um, and I just think that suited me better in a lot of different ways. But I just I just loved being embedded inside my client, um, just being able to f- just talk to people at the water cooler, really understand the business in, in a real kind of depth instead of having to kind of um, spread myself across lots of different businesses. I really enjoyed being a part of the business itself. Um, and really helping it in its journey, um, because the great thing about being an in-house lawyer, obviously I'm a convert, so I would say <laughs> the great thing about being an in-house lawyer is really the variety of what hits your desk um, and that sense of you really don't know what's going to be coming to you the next day. And so while I was an in-house lawyer and I did a lot of commercial contract work, but those commercial contracts spanned everything from um, nuclear cleanup work all the way through to cleaning contracts, uh, the emptying waste paper bins or building solar farms or all sorts of things. And the kind of variety of it was wonderful. But there is a really and another strand, actually, to why I loved in-house so much. Uh, this is going to become the in-house promo podcast. But, it's really, <laughs> but the other reason I really loved being in-house was because the people that I was often giving advice to I felt like I was really helping. It wasn't a sophisticated user coming to a sophisticated law firm. It was often a contract manager who was really worried about something that was going on on their contract and they would phone me up. And I felt like I was really helping somebody not only to do their day job, but to take that burden of worry off them. And I found that really satisfying. Yeah. So I did that for a long time, found it really satisfying. Um Sadly, I was doing it for Carillion PLC, and that company is no more, um, which is why I ended up leaving the world of in-house and went into practical law, where I just had a fantastic couple of years. Again, really trying to focus on what is going to stop people being anxious in their day job. So when I was at practical law, I was in the in-house practice area team, and I did a lot of work on helping lawyers prepare for Brexit helping lawyers navigate recessions, later pandemics, um, and also helping lawyers think about how to make their businesses more resilient for climate change, which has then became a real specialist interest for me, which is how I ended up at um, the Chancery Lane Project, where, where again, I feel like my day-to-day job is taking something that people are anxious about and helping to relieve that anxiety for them. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess, you know, you are now the director, as you say, of the uh, the Chantry Lane Project, you know, a non-profit organisation. Could you just tell us a little bit more about what you do specifically and what it does overall? Yeah, I'd love to. So um, I'm uh, the director of engagement. And what we do generally is 
our kind of our, our the heart of what we do is persuading people to use contracts to tackle climate change um, because regulation is amazing for leveling the playing field but it's really slow it's achingly slow but the great thing about contracts is you could change those in the next 20 minutes if you wanted to you could change your standard form precedent in the next 20 minutes with a good clause but getting a good clause starting from standing still basically drafting in a vacuum is really hard so what we do and what we have done is that we've pulled together um, interested parties into workshops. And these have been everyone from expert lawyers to industry experts who are totally not lawyers at all. We've got everybody in a room and said, OK, if you were going to use your finance expertise or your employment expertise or your real estate knowledge to write a contract clause to help make things better in terms of climate change, what would that look like? What would that do? How do you use all the knowledge you have about finance instead of making a profit to help the climate? climate? And really, it's the idea that we use contracts every single day to um, enshrine profit margins or deliver value or set up service specifications or good specifications. Why not add climate considerations to that list? carbon reduction targets and all of that sort of thing. And so what I do is that I do a lot of going out and talking, a lot of talking. So many people listening to this might have heard me talking and are probably already sick of it. Um, but I go out and I talk to people and I kind of say, well, here is an idea that you might not have thought of. I see that you, your company has signed up to a really ambitious climate target. Had you thought about using contracts to help you meet that? Here is how you could do it. Oh, and by the way, we've got 104 clauses and a toolkit to help you do that and loads of workshops and it's all free. I'm going to say that one more time, actually. We've got 104 clauses, a toolkit, <laughs> we've got loads of workshops and it's all free. And um, that is not the number free. That is the free as in F-R-E-E, free B. OK, folks, so make sure you're listening correct. into that. And so you do so much work as the director of engagement, Becky, it has to be said. And, you know, it's, it's wonderful the work you're doing. What does a typical day look like for you? Oh, my life. It, it's it's very varied. Um, so it, it's a lot more meetings than I had ever thought it would be in my job. My, so previously, my job was sitting in a dark room with a large pile of contracts and reviewing them. And now I spend most of my time going and talking to people. And those meetings vary. Sometimes I'm telling people about the Chancery Lane project because they have heard about us, but they want to know more about what we do. Sometimes I'm doing webinars or panels. And sometimes it's more targeted. Sometimes I'll be having a conversation where somebody will say to me, you know what, we're really interested in using these clauses, but we've come across some barriers. What can we do about that? And I'll say, well, we've got these case studies. Here's some people who already did it and how they got over those barriers. And so I really sort of see myself as a, a, an advocate for doing this in a different way. Um, and that means that I also spend quite a lot of time sort of researching what's going on so that we can draw all these really interesting threads together. Um, so here's a really great example. The other day, somebody asked me a question about our clauses. I went away and had a little look over our clauses so I could email them back and say, I think that these are the ones you want to look at. And when I did that, I reread Eric's clause. I must have read it ages ago, but I reread it. And I suddenly realised what a clever clause it was. Like, yeah. Uh, Obviously, I do get paid to say that, but it is a clever clause and I'm going to explain why. So Eric's clause is an employment clause that you could put in your employment contracts so that if somebody wanted to take a sabbatical for climate change to go off and do volunteer work for climate change, then they could do that. But it goes beyond that and it says, or if you wanted to put somebody on gardening leave, you could stipulate as part of that gardening leave that they have to spend X days a week working for a climate change charity. So isn't that amazing? Because gardening leave, a company's paying for it anyway. You could either have that person sitting at home twiddling their thumbs for six months, a year, or you could say, you can sit and twiddle your thumbs for three days a week. But for two days a week, we want you to volunteer with this climate change charity. And in doing so, you would get a whole load of extra skills and experience and knowledge, which is now becoming really important, that you can take into your next job. But it's not knowledge which is going to undermine your previous company. It's only going to lift everybody up. So sometimes my job is really just, just thinking and drawing these connections out and then 
once I've done that thinking, going out and saying to people, hey, you'd use gardening leave in your organisation. Had you thought about pegging it to volunteering for climate organisations? I love that idea. And I think it's super, super powerful and makes so much sense. And you touched on there about the Chancery Lane project, how it does assist lawyers and industry experts to create these clauses. Why do you think it is important for both lawyers, industry experts to be educated about drafting those clauses? I think there's a lot of different reasons and it's a great question. But I think the primary reason is that this is where the risk is now sitting. Climate change is such a massive area of risk. We are very familiar with using contracts to manage our risk. And I think that for anybody who's sitting there thinking climate change doesn't apply to me, and I know that there's been some recent guidance on this from the Law Society saying, you know, we are all climate lawyers now, really, in a way, because there is no area of life that climate change does not touch on. So there's no area of law and legal practice that climate change does not touch on. And so part of what we're doing when we are doing these drafting workshops and running our seminars and our webinars is helping people to upskill into something. And this is something I wanted to talk to your listeners about in particular, and it? and you know what I'm going to say, but which is that there are very few climate experts right now. There are very few climate employment experts or climate finance experts. There has never been such an exciting time to be a young lawyer, I think, because you can carve out a amazing amount of expertise in a very short period of time because everybody's starting from scratch right now. You know, the partners are starting from scratch when it comes to climate risk and climate knowledge and climate contracting. So you can get in at the ground floor on a very new practice area, which is only going to get bigger, sadly, because climate risk and climate problems are only going to get worse. And governments are only going to hopefully increase what they're doing to fix it. But that means more legislation. That means a whole new practice area of climate risk is here and now is your opportunity to get in at the ground floor. Yeah. And, you know, we always want to make sure we're educating our listeners on, you know, career opportunities and where you might be able to go. And you're absolutely right. You know, climate change is, is, is here to stay. It's a recession proof practice area. And it's, you know, you could be doing it for good. And I think that's really important to to highlight that. So thank you. And, and talking about specific purposes, you know, these clauses, they aim to really tackle climate change. Why do you think combining clauses and climate change for contract is significant? I think it really comes down to the fact that contracts are these amazingly powerful tools, aren't they? So instead of waiting for legislation, as I've said, we can use contracts and we can do that really fast. So the first thing is contracts are a really fast way of making climate change, of tackling climate change. But the second thing is that they are very specific and very bespoke. So anybody who's done any contractual work will know that when you put something in the contract, people pour over it. It will either be reviewed by lawyers or operations experts or ev somebody is going to look at this. So at the moment, we have a situation where climate is really complicated. People are trying to put plans in place, but it's really hard to put a plan in place because it's so big. A one way of eating that elephant piece by piece, toe by toe, is by saying, if you put an obligation in a contract that somebody will be on the hook for damages if they breach it, suddenly that obligation is going to be reviewed and priced and double checked by a whole team of experts who now have a piece of the puzzle on how to fix climate change. If you put a carbon reduction target in your contract and say you have to pay a penalty if you miss it, and that penalty is going to be spent by us on offsets to the tune of the amount you missed the carbon reduction by you are going to work out how to make sure you don't miss it. And there we are. Suddenly a piece of the puzzle is solved in a way that it wasn't before. And that is something that contracts do um, in the background automatically. It's something we're really familiar with. I mentioned earlier on the idea of service specifications and good specifications, you know, a carbon specification. Well, it's just what's one more three page schedule in a contract, which is already 10 binders long. Very true, very true. Time for a quick break from the show. Are you a legal aid practitioner in England and Wales, specialising in civil or criminal legal aid matters? If you are, this message is for you. 
As a legal aid solicitor, you don't have time to waste on legal aid case management software that doesn't work to your needs. That's why Clio has developed a quicker, more accurate and affordable solution for legal aid solicitors in England and Wales. It could save you hours in your month, particularly when it comes to end of month invoicing and claims to the legal aid agency. To see how it all works, visit clio.com forward slash UK forward slash legal aid. That's Clio, C-L-I-O dot com forward slash UK forward slash legal aid. Now back to the show. The Chantry Lane project focuses on climate and net zero clauses in contracts. So what is net zero, Becky? Oh, wow. Well, the best thing about net zero is there isn't a single definition. Um, And... I, I, I kind of I, I'm I hesitant to give you a definition because then somebody will pop up. This is a legal podcast. Some t- probably 20 lawyers will pop up and go, no, I think it's very different. Um, I, instead, I'm going to slightly elide your question and say that the reason we have used net zero is not because we think it's necessarily the best metric. Um, and that means that your um, carbon emissions are balanced out so that you're net by the carbon you're taking out of the environment. So you're sort of neutral, as it were, that, that you've balanced those scales. It's not that we think that's the best metric, um, but what it is, is a metric which is commonly understood and people are familiar with. And it is something that is achievable for businesses. And when so many businesses have signed up to Race for Zero, as they did over COP26, one third of FTSE 100 companies have signed up to Race for Zero. It is an easy starting point that people understand. And what we say at the Chancery Lane Project is that some of our clauses are light green. They are low ambition. They are not going to take loads of carbon out but they are a starting point that's not going to cost you anything to dip your toe in the water. And now we expect you to move up the ladder, up to the clauses that are dark green, that are aligned with Paris or go beyond Paris, that are aligned with net zero or go beyond net zero. And we are going to hold your hand every step of the way up that ladder to help you get to net zero and beyond. Brilliant. And sticking with net zero, then you also have a net zero toolkit designed to align contractual drafting with net zero. Can you explain what that toolkit is? I can. I can. There's a lot in there. Um, So the net zero toolkit really came out of COP26, where we could see that so many people were signing up to the race for zero. And we wanted to give them a really clear way to assess their current contracting. So we have a dashboard that covers seven different areas. Uh, I'm going to try and remember them now, and I don't have them in front <laughs> of me, so we'll see how well I do. But they cover things like um, the rate of warm, uh, the temperature that you're currently online for. So if you looked at all of your carbon-related activities now, are you, are you going to be pushing up the temp? If everyone did what you did, are you going to be hitting four degrees in 2030 or are you going to be hitting 1.5 degrees in 2050? Then we look at the pace. So that is, what's your time scale? Are you planning on doing it in 10 years, 20 years? Are you doing it by 2050 or sooner? You know, that sort of thing. Um, the dashboard also covers elements such as just transition. It explains what that is and shows you how you can put that into your contracting, um, asks you if you are considering it in your contracting. Uh, Governance. So have you got metrics? How are you reviewing them? How are you tracking how well you're doing about hitting your climate goals? You know, um, what are your climate goals? Have you kind of filtered those down through your organisation? Um, one of my favourite things that's in there is a section on um, lobbying, which feels like it's a little bit left field. Um, but really, uh, if you have signed up to the race for zero and you are pouring money into organisations that are lobbying against the Paris Agreement and against putting the Paris Agreement into legislation, then, you know, how are you managing that? You probably, it's probably not deliberate, but reviewing the lobbying that you are doing through all the trade associations that you signed up to is a simple thing that you could do to see where you are on that journey. And again, it shows you, and if you're not doing that, well, then you're probably missing a trick and you need to think about it. So it's a lot of different areas to help a lawyer sit down and review drafting that already exists to say, is there a way that we could continue to move up that ladder? 
But I actually think the best thing in the toolkit is a 10 minute video. A 10 minute video that explains what net zero is much better than I just did. <laughs> no, I think you did a phenomenal much, job of that. I think you did. <laughs> it's not straightforward. So you, you did a, you did a sterling job, but I would encourage people also to check out the video <laughs> just to also digest video and audio content. How about it's, that? That's um, brilliant. <laughs> the reason I think this video is so good is because it's only 10 minutes. Play it to your board. Play it at the start of a supplier kickoff meeting so that everybody in the room, before you start the business of the day, they all have the same understanding of net zero as you. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point. And, you know, let's stick with the, the, the cool toolkit again, if I can get my words out, to address this climate change specifically. Do you believe this will initiate further discussions on climate change? I think it has already initiated further discussions on climate change, which obviously I feel very good about. Um because it has really broken down the things that people need to talk about into really easy yes or no questions. And I think that really is really helpful, actually. There's a lot of um, confusion about climate change. And what I mean is this. If you can look at a clause in a contract and say, OK, this clause will take out um, X amount of carbon, because it's a carbon reduction clause. So we've got our baseline. The clause says that that baseline has got to be reduced in a year's time by X percent. So if this clause goes in and if it's complied with, we know that X percent carbon will come out. Brilliant. And your supplier comes back to you and says, that's going to cost you, uh, I don't know, a green premium of uh, an extra £20,000. Well, then there you are. How do you make that decision? But you have a very clear decision to make now. You know how much carbon is going to come out because it's in the clause. You know how that's been priced. Are you going to pay for it? Who's going to pay for it? And it just it just suddenly takes all of this, oh, we don't really know how to do it, and puts it into these really, really painful but necessary, clear questions. Yeah, no, and you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, I think it's important that, you know, this is all leading to accountability and change, which I think is paramount. So, you know, are there any um, practicalities which make drafting clauses into contracts specifically difficult? What solutions can be offered to tackle this problem? Sure. I think the biggest problem, actually, with getting climate change clauses in is buy-in. You know, who who has set who has the say over whether a contract gets changed? And and let's be real and let's be honest, some of our clauses will increase the negotiation time. Some of our clauses will attract a green premium. You know, so that and these are going to be barriers. If you want a contract where you want uh, a huge amount of value for money um, and you're not prepared to pay any more and you you need it signed yesterday and you don't want to spend another week negotiating the green clause, you know, that's a big barrier. So I think we need to take that step back. The way that we get these clauses into contracts, firstly, we make it easy by showing people the clauses are there, by showing people what can be done. I think, you know, getting over that hurdle of not being able to see what the solution could be. That's why we are here is to say, here is an option. Here is an idea. Here's a thing you could do. Um, but the next step is then buy-in. It is getting people to understand why these should and could uh, could go in. And that might mean getting all of your supply chain in a room, educating them about climate change, educating them about your organisation's goals for climate change and talking with them about how they're going to partner with you to achieve that. It might be talking to your main board of directors and saying, actually, this is probably a bigger risk for our business than we realised because of X, Y, Z. Maybe you're worried about getting sued. Um, maybe you're worried about having Extinction Rebellion blocking your offices off for five days. You know, maybe you're worried about reputation damage um, or stranded assets, but kind of saying, actually, there's a problem here that us as lawyers, we can help you fix. And one way we can do that is through contracts. And I think that having that conversation is essential. Yeah. And yeah, again, I, I just love how you're articulating this because it's just it's just pulling into line what, what I see is, is completely necessary and, and going to basically improve and make a huge difference to, to the world that we live in. So with regards to your website then, your website states you have 1,300 legal professionals collaborating and I believe 285 participating organisation, which is a heck of a lot. What types of professionals and organisations are utilising the toolkits? So a lot 
of um, law firms have looked at it and reviewed it. And some of them, and I'm going to name check TLT Law, because we've got a case study on them, have put some of our clauses into their standard form precedents. Um, so that's one way is people putting them in their standard form precedents. So they just get rolled out as standard. Um, but we also have had a huge huge amount of engagement from corporates which has just been really satisfying and i think that that's quite natural actually because probably what has happened is a csr committee somewhere has set a target and then they've told an in-house lawyer oh by the way we need to achieve that target um and so and we provide those in-house lawyers a really quick fix an easy set of tools that they can immediately start to to to, to put into their work the day-to-day work to help them fix that problem that they have been handed by somebody else um and and i think that's really helpful the other um constituency of people who have been really engaged with us and really amazing are procurement professionals non-lawyers but people who deal with contracts on a daily basis and are really very much at the sharp end of negotiating with suppliers about getting contracts um clauses into those contracts and they have been absolutely amazing and, and really engaged as well yeah and it's interesting you mentioned procurement because before i launched my my legal recruitment business casey partners um you know i did a lot of recruitment in the procurement space and uh, yeah i did a lot of work with them and still have a lot of friends and they do have an eagle eye and they are very good negotiators that's for that's for sure um sticking with with firms then nigel brooks senior equity partner oh. from clyde and quo uh clyde and co shall i say has said working with tclp has been invaluable in expanding me and my colleagues practices to encompass the practice practical considerations of climate change. What a ringing endorsement that is. How would you like future firms to benefit from working with TCLP? Oh, that's a great question. And also thank you to Nigel Brooks with Clyde & Co, who have been an absolutely amazing, um, supportive organisation, um, uh, as have many other law firms. And I can't list them all, but they are all listed on our website if you wanted to go and look. Um, how can we help? Well, I'm going to say to you the thing that I've said to lots of law firms and partners. Um, this is an area where corporates are desperate for help. This is a piece of chargeable work, not the things that we do, but the area of climate risk management. And whether that's through contracts, um, whether that's through internal policies uh, and risk assessment procedures or whatever, there is an absolutely massive problem here that lawyers could be making money out of as a practice area. And I'm going to say it in this way because, you know, obviously I am a tree hugger, but I appreciate that not everybody in the world is a tree hugger. Um, But so this is a potential practice area. And what I would really like to see is law, law firms looking at what we've done and having that spark off in their own mind. Oh, hang on a minute. Where could we take this? We can use these clauses as a starting point to suddenly build up a climate risk business. And there are accountancy firms out there. There are management firms and consultancy firms out there who have climate risk businesses. And I would like to see law firms really having climate risk businesses as well. And some are. I know that Clyde & Co and Nigel Brooks have an amazing um climate risk business. I know that Minters in Australia have an amazing climate risk business and others do as well. But this is a fantastic opportunity for lawyers. As you say, it's a recession proof practice area that's on the rise. There we go. That's got a bit of a ring to it, actually. <laughs> recession proof practice area on the rise. Yeah, but we're keeping temperatures low. Um, so in terms of, um, I guess, people wanting to be, you know, get involved with this, I'm sure it will attract a lot of interest because we do want to highlight the importance of this uh, this particular episode. How can people or companies interested uh, get involved with the project? I think there's a few different ways. And the first and the easiest is please sign up to our newsletter. When we have new events, um, when new clauses come out, because we publish new clauses or we update clauses, then it all comes out via our newsletter. And that's the best place to stay in contact with us. Past that, um, my plea would be, please look at our clauses and please use them. We have 104 If you think there is nothing in those 104 clauses that would work for your organisation, then tell me, because that's a gap that we need to fill. Um, But we have heads of terms clauses, non-disclosure agreement clauses, um, recitals to go in the front of any contract, due diligence questionnaires. We have a very wide range. There is going to be something there that, that fits 
with your organisation. And if every person on this who listens to this podcast put one clause that removed carbon into one contract, that is an amazing start of something big, isn't it? That would be huge. Absolutely. And it's just taking that first step, I think, you know, will just really kickstart things. So yes, absolutely. And and not only, Becky, are you a wonderful guest and we're loving having you on the Legally Speaking podcast, you're also a fabulous co-host of the legal podcast called The Hearing for Thomson Reuters. So what's the podcast about? What message does the podcast convey to your listeners? Oh, well, The, the Hearing is a podcast from Thomson Reuters, as you say, where we look at a lot of different issues, often um relevant social issues but we look at them through a legal lens so that's what's going on so um i've recently published an interview or thompson reuters has just published an interview with mark van Bal, who is the man behind follow this if you remember earlier in 2021 may 2021 chevron had a, a board defeat um with a shareholder resolution from Mark's organisation, which was backed by BlackRock around the Paris Agreement. It was a huge... It happened in that that wild week where the Shell decision came out and the Australia court decision came out and Exxon and Chevron both had board defeats. Well, he was the... um, non-profit organisation behind that board defeat for Chevron. And we go into the nuts and bolts of how, how it was done, which for a legal geek like me... Uh, it was absolutely perfect. And I think it's fascinating. And I think it's great that you, you do that and, and bring that content to to people. And uh, yeah, I think you do a wonderful job. So I would encourage people to definitely check out the Hearing podcast. So finally, Becky, after the 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26, and as climate change continues to be more and more prevalent, which it most definitely should be, what do you believe is the future for lawyers and the climate? I think the future for lawyers is sort of the same as everybody else in that we're all living on this planet. And really, and I don't I don't I try not to spend too much time on this, um, but things are pretty bad in terms of climate change. They are bad. But but we have a window of opportunity. Now, take take us as lawyers. Come closer, lawyers. Come closer. (laughs) Listen, Um, we are trained to look at incredibly complex things incredibly complex situations and tease out solutions and make those solutions stick. Make them stick um, because you're in breach of contract if you don't or, you know, all the many other reasons. But to make, we are there to make things really happen. Now, when you consider all of the skills that lawyers have and the crisis we're facing in the climate and how complicated it is, just imagine what could be achieved if a group of incredibly intelligent people who are very good at sifting information, complex information and coming up solutions were mobilised to fix it. Because that's us. That's you. That's me. Wow. What a powerful message. And I guess just to, to, to wrap up then, if our listeners would like to learn more about the Chancery Lane Project or your podcast, The Hearing, I know you mentioned the newsletter, you know, is that still the best way for people to contact you specifically or feel free to shout out any other social media or web links. We'll also share them with this episode for you too. So we're on Twitter and we're on LinkedIn if you want to look for Chancery Lane Project over there. Um, or you can email me at Project.org if you have a question. Um, then I would absolutely love to help you with that. Yes, absolutely. And thank you so much, Becky. It's been a real pleasure having you on, you know, really important discussion today. And I hope we've we've highlighted the importance and what practical solutions and steps and accountability we can do to really pioneer the change. But we'd like to wish you lots of continued success with the project and your career. But for all of us on the Legally Speaking podcast for now, over and out. This week's review comes from Sarah. Powerful, five stars, amazing to hear a podcast that shines a light on how varied the legal industry is. Hearing from a number of people with unique journeys consistently instills me confidence that my route is also taking me down the path of success. Incredible. Zara, thank you so, so much for your kind words from all of us on the Legally Speaking podcast. We appreciate you. 